this was amazing. What are you flashing back to a time when you used to patrol and you were out here? Yeah, yeah. So um, there was a time early in my career as a police officer. I was worked in District Four. I ran Avondale for a little while, and what you're seeing here today is not what I experienced 25 years ago. What did you so, see then? Um, property wasn't well maintained. Um, more blight. More um, criminal activity than what we're experiencing here today. Um, and it's because they take ownership. They've taken ownership. We, we as the police kind of nudge them along that way, sure. but then it's up to them to take it to the to cross the finish line. And it's not an overnight transformation though. Oh, goodness I mean, if you're no. talking about back when you were on patrol, it takes time to make these changes in these neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to get buy-in, you've got to figure out what the problem is, come up with solutions, um, get partnerships to come in and, and work with you. That all takes time. You talk about some of those partnerships, you know, when we have these shootings that take place and, and that interval, you know, just where all of a sudden there's all this stuff happening and then it goes away for a while and then it comes back. You have a lot of organizations that come forward and say, hey, we're here to help, we're here. But then it seems to kind of die away. Are there any organizations that have made promises to you uh, the CPD in general, that they say that they're there, but then they just aren't really there. Um, I don't think it's that they're not there. So, like for this project specifically, the Cincinnati Zoo stepped up. They're a great resource for this city, a great partner. Um, you've got the Avondale Development Corporation. You know, they want to do what's best for Avondale. This is a, a key indicator of that. Um, I think sometimes it's not that they don't step up by choice. It's sometimes they want to know what is it they can do. How can they help? Um, they don't want to step on our toes. Um, they want to work with us. So that's where the partnership comes in. We can kind of kind of lead them along the way and tell them, you know, what we think right. might be helpful to their community, and then help them attain that. You know, eight years ago, I did a similar walk with Chief Blackwell at the time. Mm -hmm. After a rise in shootings, there was a little girl that was killed, and what have you seen obviously different department at that time eight years ago you were working more in the investigation side what have you seen since eight years ago because it kind of seems like we're seeing the same headline it's only the names of the perpetrators suspects victims that are changing but we're still seeing these shootings and these spikes in activity yeah so there's a lot to answer that question um first you see groups neighborhoods businesses that want to partner with us. Um, they see we are committed to problem solving. And so it makes it a little easier, I think, for them to jump on board with us um, so that we can work side by side. The other thing that is big, a big difference now too is how we police. And by that, I mean training, big thing, technology, how we approach things um, bias-free. I think our crime, crime Gun Intelligence Center is a key um, example of that. You know. We can help solve shootings, reduce, um, you know, homicides through technology. Um, so all of that, you pair it all together and it helps us get these results. What's the most frustrating part though, when you have, you know, overall, the overall murders, shootings, you know, are, are, are down, but you get a spike like this where you get a group of younger members of the community who stir the pot, so to speak, and they're going back and forth in some sort of turf war. And then suddenly the major headline is that Cincinnati is a place where crime breeds. Yeah, I think the most, for me, the most frustrating thing is, it's a couple of things. One is the young age of the shooters and the people being shot nowadays. I've never seen anything like that in my career. The other thing is it, it used to be, I had an argument with you, you know, we resolved it. We might shoot one another or attempt to shoot one another. Um, but now you might have a beef with somebody. They're in a group of individuals and you just drive by and, you know, um, discharge many rounds. You don't know who you're going to hit. Somebody who you don't even have a beef with, a purely innocent bystander, could get struck. Um, and so just the, the recklessness of that attempt is uh, very disheartening very disheartening. And as we understand it, there's a group, approximately 20 to 30 young members of our community, ages ranging, but you know, 15, 16, 17, eight. Is that what we're seeing here and the main cause of the spike right now? Yeah, so obviously the city of Cincinnati has many, many youth. This is not a blanket problem with youth. Mm -hmm. This is a small group um, of youth who we are still investigating and 
we will hold accountable when it when it all comes to uh, to fruition. You'll you'll see we will hold them accountable, but it is pockets of them that are out there causing this problem, and it's a back and forth. You know, this group over here. Um, Fighting over ownership of different neighborhoods, essentially? Not even ownership. It's just, you know, you disrespected me on social media. Right. Um, so this is the way I retaliate against you. Um, you know, you talk to my girl. This is the way I'm going to retaliate against you. Things like that. So it's not a turf war. It's not a gang problem. It's groups of youth who don't know how to resolve a problem other than picking up firearms and just rec recklessly discharging those firearms. And how difficult is that to, especially with their age, one, one of our sources telling us that the 16 year old that died in South Fairmount was part of this, mm -hmm. this group. Right. So how do you follow those, those leads when there are children involved in this? So a lot of ways. Um, our intel information is, gets us tremendous um, headway in investigations. Um, so it's, you know, you got to speak to the right people. You, we have our intelligence unit that will um, monitor social media accounts for all kinds of activity in this city. Um, we can pick up leads from there. Um, like I said, our CJIC, just connecting the dots on, you know, who was connected to who. Um, when, when young kids like this are involved, when you have 16, 15, 17 year old kids involved in this, are you finding that adults, the parents, Family members are saying enough is enough and they're speaking out, even calling in their own relatives? Sometimes, sometimes we get that. I think what I see, um, you know, it's easy to say, well, where are the parents? Hold the parents accountable. And, and I do believe that to a certain point, the parents should be held accountable. But what I'm seeing now with these youth is their behavior has risen to such a level that sometimes their parents are afraid of them. So the parents are reaching out to us to say, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah. What do I do with my son or my daughter? I know they're engaged in this activity. Um, and so the best thing they can do is come to us with whatever information they have and help us help them to, to get their kids off the street. And I know in some instances, these, it, it's a weird generation. I mean, granted, you're born and raised here. This is your city. Mm -hmm. um, a mother, a grandmother. Do you, do you feel a sense of I know there's a sense of pride, sense of ownership. What's that sense of responsibility knowing that you're the chief of police in your city and kids within your city are, are doing this? Yeah, so I truly recognize the police department's role. We're, the, we're on, at the forefront of this problem. Right. We absolutely are. You know, we're the 24 seven city government entity that somebody can call and say, we have a problem, you know, it's violence, it's youth, it's whatever. Um, but once we get that call, we have to start thinking more outside the box. We being the police department, the city, the, the residents in the community, think outside the box. Police should not be the only solution to this problem. If people think the police were going to solve this by arresting their way out of this problem, we have bigger problems than youth shooting youth. Um, people have got to start thinking about how can I help the police solve this problem? Uh, you know, maybe it's getting out and working in the community like this. Uh, maybe it's mentoring youth. Um, you know, whatever, whatever ideas people have, we're open into listening to them. Um, I know that it's somewhat of a rare instance in the, in the sense, at least, you know, uh, in modern times, the FOP president uh, always likes to speak out, um, oftentimes against the administration choices that they make. One thing that FOP president, Dan Hills, I know he's a retired officer now, um, one thing that he agreed with was your decision to pull sergeants, decrease the number of sergeants and get more officers out in the street. What was your reaction when you heard he agreed with this policy? So, uh, you know, Mr. Hills is labor. I'm management. Sometimes we see eye to eye, sometimes we don't. Um, so yeah, when we see eye to eye, I take that as a win. Um, sometimes when we don't see eye to eye on something, I have to convince him. I have to explain to him my reasoning for my decisions. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I own my decisions. You know, the, the union's not going to influence me one way or another. Um, I'm, I'm confident in my ability to make a decision supported by um, whatever 
data, information, investigative tool, whatever. Um, and and I'm, I feel like I, I can live with my decisions every single day. When I first spoke to you after the announcement and your, your swearing in back in January, uh, you said a couple of things. One thing was that you know that not every officer stood behind you and you becoming chief and you had a plan to reach out and, and have some open dialogue to reach out to those officers, find out why they didn't think you were the right person and, and, and work through that and see how you guys could come together. Has that taken place? Yeah, so a couple of things I've personally been able to do is attend some roll calls. Um, I spoke at our in-service, our training at the academy. Um, we also, the city has engaged with a outside vendor to do a climate assessment for the police department. I highly encourage the officers to participate in the survey or any other ask of that uh, vendor to do the climate assessment because I look at that assessment as like a roadmap of where this department will be going over the next few years and even years after I'm gone. So if there's something about the department that they don't like or wish was different, this is their opportunity to weigh in to make that change. You mentioned the recruitment. Mm -hmm. So um, 33, I think out of the 50 some odd was recruiting class. Life That's what you, what you ended up with. Mm -hmm. um, we know that I believe 27 officers have filed for the retirement this year so far. We mentioned the sergeants going back out, so there's 24 there, then you lose 27. Mm -hmm. You're constantly in flux and trying to keep a number of officers on the street. Yeah, so you know you have to you have to weigh what are we trying to accomplish every single day on this department. Um, our priority is answering calls for service. That what that's with certainty, but we are also investigating homicides, investigating rapes, investigating gun crimes. Um, and so we need bodies in those assignments to continue that work as well. So it's not as easy as just pull everybody out and put them in uniform to answer calls for service. Um, otherwise, our investigative tools would shut down in this city. So yeah, it's constantly moving, um, constantly trying to keep our pulse on who's retiring, when will they retire, when was the last time we had a class. Um, we have a class starting next Monday, the 26th. Uh, 51 people, approximately 51, will be starting. So That's more officers in this recruitment class starting out than you had last yeah, time. Yeah, um, you know, and we fully expect whenever we have a recruit class, we lose one or two. Maybe they get in the first week and they're like, ah, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm sure. not cut out for this. You know, I'm going to go back to my old job, whatever. And that's fine. Or we might have one or two that doesn't graduate towards the end because they can't meet the standards, the state standards. And that's okay, too. We expect that. But yeah, 51 is a good number to start with. And that being said, we are already several weeks into our recruiting efforts for our next test, which will be sometime in the fall for a class in spring of next year. So this is going to be ever, ever going for us, recruiting, hiring, starting a class, graduating a class, and then moving on to the next process to repeat that process. Um, because our data shows us by 2029, if we don't continually recruit and hire and train, we're going to be we're going to be hurting for officers come 2029. So 2029 is really that critical point. Yeah. And you don't want to get to that point, obviously. Correct. I'd like to do what I can now to avoid that critical point. And part of that, I, I think just the way history and things are kind of cyclical, but like the Black Lives Matter movement that raised up and we had the marches downtown and everything that happened, there was a lot of negativity towards the police force that hurt recruiting across the country. Yeah. Uh, Cincinnati was not, you know, spared that as well. So how do you how do you continue to, I guess, even push past that? It seems like, you know, with the and I can't directly correlate the two, but the fact that you have more recruits in this next class than you did previously, maybe that's a momentum change then. Yeah, you know, I've seen it in my career. It's very cyclical. You know, we have trouble and then, it, you know, the, the hiring uh, eases a little bit and we have more luck, more success there. Um, I think we're, the pendulum is swinging back that way now. Um, we need to change the narrative in this country. And if they're not going to do it across the country, we'll do it here in Cincinnati. We'll change the narrative. This is a wonderful career. Um, you can raise a family in a very, very nice city. Um, you know, our, our economics here in Cincinnati, our home buying efforts, you know, price of homes, all of that is very, very um, easy to attain if you get a career in public service, specifically the police department. Um, you know, I've raised four kids in Cincinnati, so, and, and, and we've had a good life here. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and that's the message I'd like to get across. Not that, that law enforcement is this horrible 
career that you want to embark on, but it's this fantastic career that's not just good for you, for your family, it's good for the city. Um, we have so many opportunities. In 33 years, I couldn't tell you how many different assignments I've had doing all different kind of work in, on this job and uh, never a dull moment. So yeah, if you don't want a very, very boring job, come join us, it's exciting. One of the other changes you made is you took some of the community outreach officers, put them back out on patrol. Again, a numbers game that you're playing here. Has there been any impact by getting rid of those community outreach officers and having them in a different role? No, because what, what you're talking about, Craig, is the um, community relations unit. They were centralized and they had different areas of responsibility um, with our immigration population, with our LGBTQ population, okay. with our um, faith-based leaders in this city. Those roles are still being fulfilled. We just decentralize those and put them into the districts. But those same officers are carrying on with those same area of responsibilities. Okay. They're just not doing it from a centralized location. Gotcha. Um, what about bringing back former officers, crime prevention officers, and bringing them into the mix, perhaps, with everything we're seeing going on? Yeah, I'm open to anything. You know, the. Um, we do work with the union, obviously, and so there's, there's union issues that I have to be very careful and very mindful of um, when we talk about um, trying to use different people in different roles to help us through this, this crunch of uh, staffing shortages. But uh, I'm open to any ideas. Uh, clearly, it's kind of bright. It's, a, it's much brighter up here. Uh, the, the basketball court looks like freshly painted. You yeah. see the garden going in. So when you look at this, is this optimism? Is this, is this something very positive that you're hoping that the, now the community, the community comes back? Like, is this a reward for the community? Yeah, this is absolutely a reward for the community. I hope every community member that drives past here, walks through here, sees the same um, potential optimism that I see, or that this, the police department sees as a whole. Um, you know, it was District 4 officers who rolled up their sleeves and got involved with community partners to get this done. Uh, so kudos to them for that. I think even if you expand past this park, you saw the housing up the street, you've got the Cincinnati Zoo here, you've got development all over the Avondale neighborhood. Um, I think each and every point of that is optimistic. And it talks to the, the point of partnerships that Absolutely. you guys can't do it alone. Yeah, and I really do think there are community groups, um, businesses, corporations in this city that want to help. We just have to be more deliberate in the ask right. of them um, because once we ask them and once we, we show that we'll be side by side with them, we'll be partnering with them on whatever the endeavor is, I think they're all in. Regarding crime that we've seen in, in Cincinnati, I know there's a huge spike when we were pulling numbers. Actually, we were pulling numbers tied to at, right after the Grant Park mm -hmm. shooting. Mm -hmm. We started taking a look at numbers, um, other crime numbers, and one of the things that really popped um, that we saw with some communities with 400, even 700 percent increase in car thefts. Mm -hmm. yep. The gun, the gun issues we're seeing, and the violence there, and the car is. Does any of that connect? Or are we talking two separate issues going on right now? I think it's a combination of both. I think some of them are connected. Some of them are completely separate. Um, I do applaud the city's position that they took on these Kia and Hyundai thefts for the class action lawsuit. That's a tool that to help us get uh, this problem resolved. Um, so yeah, definitely there. Um, you know, the other thing is to, to the Kia and Hyundai owners, be mindful of this. This is not a Cincinnati specific problem. It started with the TikTok challenge, TikTok video. Right. That, you know, shows you the power of social media. Which right leads there. you right back even to some of these younger youths and what they're involved in, and that if somebody posts a TikTok video, they react to it and their only way to deal with it instead of come over and say, hey, don't post that anymore, is to pull out a gun. Correct. Correct. And that has to frustrate you, though. Yeah, oh, it is frustrating. It's very frustrating. How are they getting these guns? You know, we want um, responsible gun ownership. You know, that's why the city passed the new legislation for the, the safe storage, things like that. Um, so, yeah, if you're a gun owner, more power to you. If you but be a responsible gun owner. We have lo gun locks. We'll give them away. And you can go to any district and ask for a gun lock. If you're a responsible gun owner, that way if somebody does steal your gun, maybe it's not operable for when they do lose their temper with somebody. And the community gun issue yeah. doesn't seem to go away either. Right, right. I, th I don't think the community gun issue is anything new to us. Sure. It's just more prevalent now right. than it was years and years ago. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not uncommon for the same gun to be involved in multiple crimes. 
Um, it's just at the forefront of our strategy now because we have the Crime Gun Intelligence Center that is connecting all the dots for certain for us sure. and not just, uh, not just thinking it might be connected. I mean, Cincinnati's not alone. Um, you know, if we look at Cleveland, we look at Chicago, Chicago's had a really rough stretch for many years. Is Cincinnati importing crime as it gets pushed out of hot spots like Chicago and Cleveland? Are we seeing a little bit of import of yeah, crime? I don't have anything, any data, nothing that's been relayed to me to indicate that, no. Okay, so everything that we're seeing is just kind of, these are kids that have been brought up here, that are here, they're not coming Correct. from elsewhere. Correct. Um, and so now you just need the buy-in of the parents and families and anybody else who might be fearful in their own communities to come out and sit on their front porch to pick up that phone call. Right. You know, it, and it sounds cliche. We've said this for many years. If you see something, say something to us. And I've even taken a little further. If you just hear something, tell us what you're hearing. You don't have to see anything, right. but just tell us what you're hearing and then we'll take it from there. All right, finally, we've got to talk about Taylor Swift real quick. I'm getting, I'm getting, <laughs> the, I'm getting the wrap. So 20 to 30, uh, we, you told me she has to be somewhere at three. It's two twenty-three. Um, I haven't had lunch yet, Craig. So, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I need you to be. I need you to eat. Um, Taylor Swift likely to have, aside from the thousands, tens of thousands in the stadium, twenty, thirty thousand Swifties outside the stadium, listening and singing and partying. What is the game plan for Taylor Swift? Yeah, so um, we have our, our supplemental summer staffing that we put in place a few weeks ago. Um, we really have those designed two different ways. One, if there's no big large events going on in the city, we have a certain level of presence. And then if we do have a large events going on, we kind of up our game in the presence. And so obviously for Taylor Swift, we've upped our game there. We got the Reds in town. Um, you know, I was in a meeting yesterday getting ready to talk about music festival weekend and what that's going to look like for right. the city. That's going to be another big weekend um, right behind Taylor Swift. So we're ready. We're ready. We'll put more cops out. Is know? this kind of like an all hands on deck for Taylor Swift? Yeah, yeah, this is a uh, what we call no time off. So officers can't take a vacation day, a discretionary at the last moment um, because we need everybody. We need everybody. But it's good for the city. It's amazing for the city to have Taylor Swift and then uh, the Reds. Come on, the Reds are doing great right now. I know, that nice so, little streak. Yeah. I don't know about the, the game today or yet. They're losing, right? When I pulled right up, now. they were losing three to nothing. Oh, so. no. Oh, no. <laughs> That's okay. It was early. We got to do something to change that. It was early. Um, anything else? that just with everything that's going on, because clearly you get people, I think, who live in Westchester, who may live outside of the city limits. Maybe there's Anderson Township, and they want to stay at the pub out in Anderson Township. They don't want to come in because of these headlines. Right. What do you say to people who live outside of Cincinnati to get them downtown spending money and, and yeah. enjoying Cincinnati with their family? Yeah, I would say Cincinnati is extremely safe. Come downtown, OTR, wherever for dinner, drinks, whatever you're coming down for. It is extremely safe. Um, we've got our eyes on what's going on. Uh, but with that, you should always be very mindful of your surroundings, you know? Don't go to, into, if, if something's kind of giving you that feeling that you're about to enter into an ins, unsafe area, don't go, right. don't go in that area. Turn around, walk the other way. If you're seeing something that you think is just a, a high risk um, opportunity for somebody, give us a call, right. we'll, we'll come check it out. Very good. Chief, thank you very much.